praise the lord hallelujah the book of psalms 127 verse 3 the bible says like this sons are indeed a heritage from the lord the fruit of the womb a reward so the bible clearly says that the children are the gift from god and nowadays when we look at the world we can see so many children are being aborted so far this year around 21 million children are aborted globally and in this lockdown we see that in all over the world with covid 19 so many people had passed away but we are very much concerned about that but what about the children are being aborted every day there is a saint called saint gianna when she was pregnant with her fourth child she has been diagnosed with fibroma so the doctor told her that you need to go for abortion and then you need to go for a hysterectomy but she was not willing to do that so that the baby could live and after the baby born after a week she passed away so what is that mean my dear brothers and sisters god is the one who is giving us a life and we don't have any right to take this life away and in the bible in the old testament we see a faithful mother in the book of second maccabees chapter 7 verse 22 there we see that king antioch was compelling the children and the mother to break the commandment of god and the mother and the children were very faithful and the seven children were murdered but the mother said a beautiful bible verse we can see that in second maccabees chapter 7 verse 22 it says like this i do not know how you came into being in my womb it was not i gave you life or breath nor i who set in order the elements each of you she believed that god is the creator of all life bishop fulton jeshin once said like this when we see a pregnant woman we can genuflect like we genuflect in front of the tabernacle because she is the sanctuary of life and she is carrying a life in the womb that is sacred the bible says in book of jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 before i formed you in the womb i knew you once mother teresa she said a beautiful quote like this it is a poverty to decide that a child must die so that you may live as you wish in 1531 in mexico in guadalupe our lady appeared to a person called von diego this is the time in mexico there were so many abortions and infant sacrifice sacrifices were happening and our lady when she appeared she was pregnant proclaiming the sanctity and the blessedness of life in the womb and she is the patroness of the unborn children so my dear brothers and sisters think about a doctor who perform the abortion he is murdering the innocent lives and the people who are assisting for the abortion may be a nurse or a midwife or a health professional or whoever is assisting for the abortion they are also assisting for the murder of innocent life now we can watch a beautiful testimony of a doctor he is going to explain that what is really happening during the time of abortion praise the lord hallelujah my name is dr anthony levitino i'm a practicing obstetrician gynecologist and i've performed over 1200 abortions today i'm going to describe a second trimester surgical abortion called dilatation and evacuation or dne the dne is performed between 13 and 24 weeks of pregnancy After administering anesthesia, the abortionist uses a weighted speculum like this one that opens the vagina widely. Because second trimester babies are so large, this greater access facilitates a late-term abortion. Late-term abortion requires that the cervix be prepared 24 to 48 hours in advance with laminaria. 
Laminaria is a type of sterilized seaweed that absorbs water over 8 to 12 hours and swells to several times its original diameter. Once removed, metal dilators can be used to further open the cervix as needed. Once the cervix has been stretched open, the suction tube is placed inside. A baby at 20 weeks gestation is as big as the length of my hand, from head to rump, not counting the legs. The suction machine is turned on, and pale yellow amniotic fluid surrounding the baby is suctioned out through the catheters. But babies this big, they don't fit through catheters this size. The baby's bones and skull are too strong to be torn apart by suction alone. This is a sofa clamp. A sofa clamp is made of stainless steel. It's about 13 inches long. The business end is about two and a half inches long and a half inch wide, and there are rows of sharp teeth. This is a grasping instrument. When it gets a hold of something, it does not let go. The abortionist uses this clamp to grasp an arm or leg. Once he has a firm grip, the abortionist pulls hard in order to tear the limb from the baby's body. One by one, the rest of the limbs are removed, along with the intestines, the spine, and the heart and lungs. Usually the most difficult part of the procedure is extracting the baby's head, which is about the size of a large plum at 20 weeks. The head is grasped and crushed. The abortionist knows he has crushed the skull when a white substance comes out of the cervix. This was the baby's brains. The abortionist then removes skull pieces. He removes the placenta and any leftover parts of the baby with a curette, scraping the lining of the uterus for any remaining tissue. The abortionist then collects the baby parts and reassembles them to make sure that there are two arms, two legs, and all the pieces. Once all the parts have been accounted for, the abortion is complete. For the woman, this procedure carries a significant risk of major complications, including perforation or laceration of the uterus or cervix with possible damage to the bowel, bladder, and other maternal organs. Infection and hemorrhage can also occur, which can even lead to death. Future pregnancies are also at greater risk for loss or premature delivery due to abortion-related trauma and injury to the cervix. As I mentioned at the beginning, I'm Dr. Anthony Levitino, and in the early part of my career as an OBGYN, I performed over 1,200 abortions. One day, after completing one of those abortions, I looked at the remains of a pre-born child whose life I had ended, and all I could see was someone's son or daughter. I came to realize that killing a baby at any stage of pregnancy for any reason is wrong. I want you to know today, no matter where you're at or what you've done, you can change. Make a decision today to protect the pre-born. Thank you for your time. Okay, so we've just finished listening to a talk on why abortion is murder and why we believe that. Um, and as you can tell, you know, by the talk that my mom has just given that we as a family, we are pro-life and there are many other families and people out there in the world who are pro-life. So uh, we're going to go into a question answer session on why, why we believe we're pro-life and, you know, in some more of the de detailed questions you know, specifics on what if this happens and what if that happens. So, the first question is, why be pro-life and not pro-choice? Well, I think the first thing is, um, as from the talk, you know, hopefully you guys have been a bit more convinced that abortion is still murder, it's still the taking of an innocent person's life. And I believe no human should be involved in the taking of an innocent person's life. An innocent person has no right for their life to be taken away if they've done nothing wrong and we as Christians especially we're not in the role of God only God is a person who judges when life can go when you know life can't go so I think that's the main thing for us is it's that it is a murder and we as Christians believe murder is wrong and no other human has the right to take another innocent person's life and I think most personally for me I remember uh, I was at a retreat once and they showed a video of um, abortion and what exactly was happening to the babies and you know the pictures is very graphic images of what of what these babies look like after abortion and I remember just being in the crowd at that time and just watching the video and just I was like crying I genuinely tears just started flowing out my eyes because I was so upset that people um, people were actually so heartless in the sense that they could kill babies who had done essentially nothing wrong you know it wasn't their fault uh, and they had done nothing wrong and I remember just crying and I, I remember from that moment as well just being more convinced in my heart 
that abortion really was wrong and it's not something that any person whether you're christian or not should take part in and and i think that's it was really moving for me and also there have been times in my life where you know i've had to stand up and I, every time i have stood up for my um stance on abortion um it's only convinced me more and it's only made me more stronger to protect the life of the unborn so how do we stand against abortion in our society today so some of the ideas that we have had are participating in march for life rallies and joining with those who pray outside of the abortion clinics and also just to defend human life in the everyday conversations that you have with different people something that's really important especially to the younger people out there and this is really important for me and for Austin when we were at school is to defend human life throughout all of the debates that happen in school you know even if you're a minority and the last really simple thing is to sign the petitions against abortion and the laws related to abortion that are going to be put in place and we leave the links to these petitions down in the description box so after watching this video you can go and sign them so the next question is should you abort an unborn baby with disabilities so i want to start the answer to this question off with a bible verse which is genesis chapter 1 verses 27 so god created mankind in his own image so here the word of god teaches us that everyone is created in the image and likeness of god so this includes those children and those people with disabilities and deformities and this is telling us that they are no less of a person and their lives are still sacred so we as humans have no right to take that away so we know so many different families with children with disabilities and they have all said that it's a blessing and that those children are a gift from God um, and even in our family as well um, we we would have had a sister and her name is Catherine um, she's resting in heaven um, and she passed in the womb now before she was um, while you know while she was still in the mother's womb uh, she was diagnosed with Turner syndrome and we could have easily said as a family and my mom could have easily said um, no we don't want this child it would be difficult for us um, it would be difficult for the child but we didn't because we still have a respect for the sanctity of life whether that life involves a person who is disabled, life is still life and we, we, we're not in a place to abort the baby or to kill the baby just because it has a disability. And I think it all, also comes down to, um, you know, if there was a disabled person in front of you and if I was to ask you to harm this disabled person just because they were disabled, you know, very few of us, hopefully none of us would ever think of doing anything like that. In the same way, why, why is it any different when it comes to an unborn child's life? just because you have a disability, is that a reason why you can take somebody's life? Okay, so the last and final question we have, and it's a very, very important question, is does God forgive those who have had an abortion? And um, I want to answer with a few Bible verses um, in this for the answer to this question. So the first one is from Psalm 32, 5, and it's just a general confession um, Bible verse, and it says this, I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and then you forgave the guilt of my sin. Now in this verse, it does not specify what sin or how big the sin or how little the sin. At the end of the day, it says, I acknowledge my sin to you. I did not hide my iniquity. I conf and I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Then you forgave the guilt of my sin. So it's once we confess, we are forgiven. And it doesn't matter even if it's murder, even if it is abortion, the moment you confess your sin in confession, that sin is wiped out, regardless of the degree of the sin or how big or how serious or severe you might be. You might have had multiple abortions, but if you confess to the Lord now, He is ready to forgive you. As one more verse, um, 1 John chapter 1, verses 9, it says this, again, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just. He will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Once again, the Lord makes it very clear that once we confess our sins, He is faithful and just. He is just. He's a God of justice. And if you are a person that has come with a repentant, sincere, repentant heart, He will forgive you of your sin. And then the final verse, which I believe is very important and very beautiful, is from 
the letter to the Roman chapter 8 verses 35 and it says this what shall separate us from the love of Christ shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword in fact at the end of that passage it says for nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord nothing at all not even your sin of abortion even if we were to commit a sin of murder, mass murder, the moment we repent, God's love will be there to cover us and to cover our sin completely, regardless of how bad of a sinner we think we are. In God's eyes, we are just another person who is lost and coming back to receive forgiveness. So if you are a person maybe watching this video and you have committed abortions before, maybe multiple, I encourage you you know if you feel repentant in your heart to go to confession and confess that sin to the Lord he is ready in this moment to take you into his arms and to forgive all your sins amen so I hope you found this useful and always remember that you know regardless of our sin regardless of what we have done in our past life the moment we confess the Lord is there to await awaiting us and he's ready to take up ourselves and our bodies and our lives into his hands amen Praise the Lord. So now we're going to go into a moment of worship. And in this worship, I invite you just to reflect on the forgiving love of our God in heaven. In the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15, we see a similar father figure who, even though his son left him and rejected him and went for everything the world had to offer him, the moment he repented and turned back to him, the father loved him with all that he had. So in the same way, I invite you now, no matter what wrongdoing you may have done in your past, in this moment just to repent and to turn to the all-loving God our Father who is ready to love you and who is ready to accept you whenever you turn to him. So this next song we sing as we worship and pray together we reflect on this great love of our God and we pray that his love will fill each and every one of our hearts. Amen. How great is your love for me That you gave up your son for me Now I am alive and free Father, I love you Father, I love you Your love may Every part of me, Father, you love me, Father, you love me, and all oh, the love of my Father is deeper than any love I shows me his love overwhelming this I know the love of my father the love of my father the love of my father Love like yours in your prayer. 
this I know The love of my Father 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 His love overwhelming this I know The love of my Father The love of my Father The love of my Father Jesus, we thank you for your great love. Jesus, we pray that your love fill the hearts of the whole world. Every person in this world will be filled with your great love, Jesus. To love you, to love one another, so that we may live together in the peace and in the love that you have for us. In your name we pray. Amen.